it's it's one thing to want to have artificial intelligence, you know, really advanced robotics, whatever it is, right? But you, the thing that I think that you're very concerned about is who's in control of this technology and who's this technology ultimately going to serve? Yeah. And if you could get into that a bit, like w- what are your general concerns? And maybe we can get into some of the details of that. Sure. Well, let me uh, start off by saying that uh, I gr- I've grown up around computers. Uh, you know, I grew up in an IBM community. My dad was an IBM and NASA engineer. Um, I grew up learning how to uh, to use computers and to code in a bunch of different languages when I was, uh, you know, in the kid in the in the early 80s. Uh, I'm not particularly afraid of computers. I'm not worried that you know Skynet's about to happen or that uh, our right. robot overlords are about to take over. I think the thing that concerns me more is that um, will some uh, the, I, I see people wanting computers to make decisions for us as though the computers could somehow do that in a neutral way, uh, uh, which is a little bit like looking at a calculator on your desk and wanting it to balance your checkbook for you. Mm, you know, yeah. the, the, the calculator is a tool. Um, the results that you'll get out of it will depend very much upon your learning how to use it and apply that tool well. And this is true, I think, of any kind of technology that we've got. So a knife, for instance, a knife is a really simple piece of technology. We've had it for tens of thousands of years. And a knife on its own is not good or bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so much depends upon the intentions that we bring to it and what we expect from it. So a knife that's pulled upon you uh, in a subway or a dark alley, uh, you know, in some place where you have no other defense and somebody holds it against you as a, a weapon, this is a bad use of a knife. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a knife in the hands of a surgeon might be the very thing that saves your life. So the knife alone is not enough. Now, what, what we need then is some set of ethical principles that will guide us in the use of the knife. Uh, and not just ethical principles, but good character. We need to be the kinds of people who have uh, spent time using the tools and talking together about the tools and deciding how we'll use the tools and not just um, be the tools of others. Mm, right. So, you know, when I think about um, Facebook, for instance, uh, Facebook sometimes will, uh, the, the corporation will offer announcements like they're going to help us to sort out uh, false news from true news or accurate news. That all sounds great, you know, that in in terms of corporate social responsibility, if Facebook feels an obligation to help us to distinguish between uh, false news and and accurate news, that's wonderful. The bad thing is if somebody will say, therefore, I don't have to think about discerning the true from the false, the the helpful from the unhelpful, the malicious from the uh, from the the, the well-intended. if Facebook wants to do that, I'd like to know what are the tools that they plan to use? What are the algorithms that they wish to use in order to distinguish between good news and bad news, between uh, you know helpful news and unhelpful news, or between accurate accounts and inaccurate accounts of events? If Facebook thinks that you can do this simply by um, some of the what's become uh, already standard means of machine learning. I think that they're gravely mistaken and we would be mistaken to follow them. Uh, well, a lot of what has been done with machine learning has been asking machines to watch the decisions that other people make and then to assume that whatever decisions people make on a regular basis are probably the best decisions. And they may be the safest decisions, but that's not always the most accurate or the best, the morally or ethically best. So an example would be if you want to teach a car to drive itself. One thing you could do is you could just tell it anytime you see a red octagon with the letters STOP, then you should come to a a full halt before you pass that sign. Right. Another way that you could do it, and this is something that a number of companies have been pursuing uh, that's uh, faster and oftentimes more accurate, is put a camera in front of a car, uh, in, in, fr- in fact, and put it in front of uh, you know, on the dashboard of, say, thousands of cars, and let lo- the, a computer observe lots and lots of people driving. 
And eventually the computer will notice that people stop not only when they see those red octagons, but also when they see a child about to cross the street or when they see bicyclists or when they see a red uh, stoplight rather than a green stoplight, uh, etc. You know, the, it'll start right. to a whole bunch of things. And in that case, it's actually helpful to have the machine notice what human beings do and imitate it. Except it might also be that in some places, people don't stop for stop signs. Hmm. So, so for instance, in some very high crime areas around the world, uh, it can be dangerous to stop for a stop sign. If you stop for the stop sign, uh, you actually put yourself in some peril because stopping your car makes you more vulnerable to people who might be outside the car and wishing to rob you. So what if machines are watching all around the world and have no sense of context and they notice that, say, 75 percent of the time we stop at octagons, but 25 percent of the time we don't? Are we inviting cars now in any circumstance to stop three out of four times or are we doing something else to help to train them? And here I think this requires a lot more um, ethical decision making and cultural and contextual decision making on the part of the human beings who are programming those cars.